Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this preview and conversation about making space, uh, women artists in post-war abstraction. And I'm joined by two co-curators, Sarah Meister, curator in the Department of Photography, and Star Figura, curator in the Department of Drawings and Prints. Um, so let's start with the genesis of this exhibition. Uh, why women and why post-war abstraction? Well, um, the genesis of this exhibition started, I think, last summer. Sarah and I were asked to collaborate on a show that would highlight some uh, aspect of the museum's mid-century collection. Um, and this was um, purposefully to um, uh, accommodate the museum's post-war collections because the Rauschenberg exhibition was going into the fourth floor galleries where you would normally see that. So Sarah and I combed through, I think, our database and saw every single artwork between like 1940 and 1970. And what struck us both was how many really amazing works there were by women artists and that many of them were um, acquired within the last 15 years or so and had not been on view. And we thought this would be something um, exciting to, to spotlight and to see what those works might tell us in terms of some kind of narrative. And um, what they told us was that there were women during this period, many women, some of them um, figures who are not so well known, some of them figures who are well known, but that um, there was uh, a history to um, their involvement with abstraction and that we could trace that using uh, works in all different mediums from our collection. One of the things you mentioned was a number of works that were recently acquired. Uh, when I was walking through the exhibition earlier, uh, I noticed how many works were also acquired almost at the time they were made. And there's an interesting dialogue going on, I think, about how we collect and how we display. I think you're right. We, we've been struck by how many works in the show were acquired in the 50s and 60s and actually lived an active life at the time, included in the Eleanor Micas painting, included in a recent acquisition show in 1965, given then as the gift of Louise Nevelson. Um, and, but those networks and those relationships and those acquisitions, they seem to kind of drop off and then this second wave, a more recent effort um, that's part of an institutional commitment, as you know, for or to improve the representation of women artists in the collection. And so it was wonderful to look at these historic acquisitions and to bring some of them out of storage that hadn't been shown recently at all. Other, some favorites that had been in the 1960s show to just move them across the floor. Um, and then also to be able to highlight all of these spectacular recent acquisitions that kind of expand and amplify some of these stories that started more than a half century ago. Do you want to situate this project in the larger context of a number of the women's initiatives that have been taking place? Uh, some of you may know that uh, through the patronage of Sarah Peter, who came to the museum probably close to 15 years ago, uh, and challenged us to be more active in our commitment to women, not just in terms of exhibitions and acquisitions, but also research, that we have developed, I hope, what is a robust program now that endeavors to ensure that our commitment to women uh, is as strong as it is to our commitment to men and others. Yes, well, I think you, you framed it pretty, pretty accurately and that um, I think that's been for about the last 15 years, I would say, and that it's really every single curator in this whole museum is involved in this, this effort. Um, so this show is very much, it's not a beginning, it's not an end, it's one event in an ongoing process of looking at women artists and amplifying the way that they're represented here at MoMA. And you'll notice um, many of these artists are featured in that 2010 publication we did, um, wi Modern Women, uh, Women Artists at the Museum of Modern Art. And one of the ways in which this is acknowledged as you go through the exhibition is you'll notice a lot of the audio guides are not just the two of us talking, 
but a really broad cross-section of curators, past and present, who have been interested in examining these works. So that's something where you have to listen to the audio guide to find it, but we, we thought it was really wonderful to include all of these voices of our curatorial colleagues, and then whenever possible, these women's voices. So if you, again, in the audio guide, we found with the collaboration of our Department of Education, extraordinary archival footage from many of these artists speaking about their own work, the challenges they faced making it, and we really felt like that was an incredible uh, counterpoint when you're standing in front of their piece to really try to remember what challenges they faced in making them. A number of the women uh, in this exhibition were married to artists as well who are quite well known. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that kind of tension and the degree to which, maybe it isn't a tension, the, how that relationship between two artists working very much at the same time and in the same vein plays out in how we read some of these works? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I think it's most relevant to the first um, section of the exhibition, which has to do with abstract expressionism. So many of the artists that you see there, uh, Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock, Elaine de Kooning and Willem de Kooning, um, and on and on, had uh, Dorothy Daner and T Tony Smith, uh, uh, so, sorry, David Smith. So um, it's very much, a fact that the men associated with that movement are very well known and the women artists are much less so. And so there's a sort of ongoing effort, to, not just by us, but you see all kinds of exhibitions um, to, to, to bring these figures back to, to light. And I think what's interesting about the trajectory of the show is it starts with this moment um, you know, right after World War II when gender norms are sort of being um, very much reinforced. And it's very difficult for women to find a place within the kind of hyper-masculine world of abstract expressionism. And so these women are trying to make space for themselves um, within a tradition of painting and sculpture that's been dominated by men for centuries and it is very uh, masculine in that particular movement. But then by the end of the show, what you start to see happening is um, the breaking down of some of the traditions that starts in the 60s and um, the reassertion or the, the reclaiming of notions of craft and the use of unorthodox materials and techniques as a way of finding another space outside of um, the traditional hierarchies that had been so difficult for women to navigate previously. Yeah, and I think just to underscore what Star is saying, it's like in that first gallery, the vast majority of the women were married to men who's, as Star was saying, who are arguably better known. And by the last gallery, we look at each other and we think, well, were they married? To whom? Did it matter? Do we care? And it really does reflect a sort of cultural and social evolution. You know, it, it, I think it was very hard in the years after the Second World War to be an unmarried woman was a, you know, there was perceived to be something wrong with you if you weren't married. And I think these women um, were very supportive of their husbands' careers and interested, you know, their uh, their dedication to art broadly, uh, I think many of them, you know, we obviously Lee Krasner with Jackson Pollock or Dorothy Daner with uh, David Smith, you know, these are women who it's really only when divorce or death allows them to really step into the foreground in their own practices. There, you, you talk about the last gallery in the exhibition. I was really struck by that moment with Sheila Hicks and Ruth Azawa and Magdalena Kanovich. I, I mean, those works stand out so strongly in several, at least the, the Azawa is new to the collection. Uh, how do you, uh, you know, beyond just the, 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 the invocation of craft as a, as a strategy, how do you see those works in relationship, let's say, to uh, the previous room, which to a large extent deals with questions of monochromicity and has a very different feel to it? One of the things we liked about the connection between those galleries is that in many ways this interest in textiles and in fiber 
that becomes its own kind of abstract grid. And yet the solutions of looking at, let's say, an Agnes Martin, where the grid could be read as a warp and wolf of a textile, that becomes on a different scale and in a very kind of imposing, um, threatening almost way in the work of Abakanovich. So we, um, or if you look at Yayo Kusama, who's sort of obsessive uh, threading of her nets, that also translates. So we were interested in the sort of point and counterpoint of how how fiber and textiles become their own kind of abstract grid and how that plays out not only in painting but also in textile based work and in prints and um, etchings from that sec from that fourth gallery one of the moments that really struck me early on in the exhibition uh, is the presence of Latin American artists uh, especially uh, where our collection course through the Cisneros gift has gotten even stronger but where where those voices really feel very strong and different in a sense with, in terms of their interest in abstraction it's a very different pitch from uh, Frankenthaler or uh, Elaine de Kooning do you want to explore that a little bit yeah I mean it's interesting those the two sides of that first section uh, which were really happening at the same time. Abstract expressionism, you think of the heyday in the 50s, and then the, uh, the geometric abstraction, um, which was the dominant mode of avant-garde art in Latin America, also in the 1950s. Two very different approaches. I think the Latin American artists were, um, it was a different social um, uh, and political situation where, um, the, the geometric impulse was very much tied to other issues of sort of um, um, architectural projects, um, uh, national um, um, building, um, and sort of bringing the um, individual countries I into the international world. And they looked to the models of uh, cubism and constructivism in Europe in order to, um, to, to um, to pursue those those ends, and um, so it's it's very very interesting that women played such a, a key role among the, the many uh, sort of socially and artistically progressive circles in four key countries, which were Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, and Uruguay, and you know. Um, Glenn mentioned the Cisneros gift, which was transformative for our museum, and most of the Latin American works are from the Cisneros gift in that gallery, um, which was acquired last year. And the others were acquired a little bit earlier, but in fact, many of the artists in that gallery were not, there were no works by any of them in the collection, say, 15 years ago. So it's really, there. I would say there must be at least 15 artists in this show in which that's the case. And just as a photography curator, I can't help but call out the photograph that's projected behind us is one of these recent acquisitions that the Latin American Caribbean Fund support has made possible here. Um, and it, it is really interesting for us to see the way in which the media, we're able to sort of find meaningful points of connection between photography and contemporary painting and sculpture so that the works by Altschul where she's exploring an abstract idiom in the early 1950s at this very moment in Brazil where the construction, the infrastructure development and the dialogues were evolving all at the same time. You know, one of the things that uh, has um, certainly affected the way we approach our collection and installations is the CMAP research project, which is the contemporary and modern arts perspectives in a global world, and a research initiative that has no underlying commitment to an end result. It's really to do the deep thinking and research in various areas that uh, we're interested in, one of which, of course, is Latin America. And it just seems to me that so many ideas now percolate out of that research that aren't even specific to a region. And it's more about how looking carefully at art that we might be unfamiliar with enables us to see art we know better or more f in a more familiar way in a different way. 
Absolutely. You know, so the Altschul photograph certainly came out of trips to Brazil that um, happened through CMAP. And both Star and I were in Colombia in the fall, and we had the opportunity to visit the studio of Felicia Burston, whose sculpture is in the last gallery. And that was just such an incredibly powerful moment for the two of us. And we walked out of that studio visit, and we were like, this is so this is so important you know and we knew we were working on this show and we um and then that's the one work that is a uh, that is in the Cisneros collection at the moment if you read the credit line carefully but that Patty very generously loaned to us with the intention of making it a part of the collection eventually but to see her work in the context of uh, Tanaka's work or Bontaku it really it is exciting in both directions both to bring that into the collection and to look at it in the broader, into landscapes with which we're more familiar. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me turn to all of you now and see if you have questions that you would like to ask Sarah or Star. I was looking for you, Lee. I was looking over here. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, there, there are definitely things that, that we don't have, and, and some artists that we don't have, that we, some artists that we probably don't even know we don't have, I'm sure, we'll, we will keep finding. Um, and also, some artists who maybe we've acquired recently, but we really need um, to broaden uh, what, we ha what we're able to, to show by them. For, for example, Alma Thomas who was recently added to the collection. We have a painting from the 70s as well as the beautiful collage that's in the show, but uh, um, you know, that's an important artist where we might wanna have a slightly broader representation of her work, just one example. You know, n nothing's coming to my mind at right this second because we're so focused on the, the exhibition, but um, we could certainly think about it and get back to I you. I mean, you know, I will say we, uh, you know, as curators, w and Star is a drawing and print curator, I'm a photography curator, um, m our overall impression wasn't, I mean, certainly it's important to look critically and see what's missing, who's missing, you know, what can we do better, but the, really our, our primary focus in this was, you know, how do we show these moments, these works, these artists to their best advantage? Like, what are the most interesting juxtapositions, new connections that we can make? And how extraordinary that we can make these from the collection. Um, you know, that certainly dominated our dialogue. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question, Lee, and I, I might frame it in a slightly larger, um, institutional perspective, which is these exhibitions, and I'd put the uh, earlier exhibition of the Russian avant-garde that preceded this, um, in the same category. They're opportunities to dive deeply into our collection, to look thoughtfully at it, to interrogate it, uh, and if we've done our job well, to ask sets of questions that we'll be pondering for months and years later that I hope will lead us to both uh, Amplifying the collection, so thinking about what's missing, that's part of any curatorial practice, but even more importantly, to thinking about how these very concise, deep dives into a, into a, a fragment of our collection can express themselves in other moments throughout the uh, museum. And, that, and I think it, th these projects play in both ways, right? They give us that opportunity to look really carefully, to discover something about ourselves that perhaps we weren't aware of, but also to become acutely aware of what else we need to do. Because I think one of you said it's neither a beginning or an end, it's a process. This is a point along a very long progression at which we take stock of what we have and how we think about it. And I, and I think the other thing that, that's interesting, it, we almost take for granted now, but a decade ago would have been a question here, which is can an exhibition of the collection embrace photography, prints, drawings, painting, sculpture seamlessly? Or did these media require very separate 
moments. And I think what we're discovering, and we're not alone, we're maybe even um, you know, part of a much larger uh, group of institutions that, that are acutely aware that the conversations across media are as interesting as some of the conversations between artists. And that this now is normal, not uh, surprising. Other questions? Sorry. Sorry, just to amplify that last point, you know, the first gallery, when you walk in, you look to your right and you see the photographs, that abstract photographs from the 50s and 60s, the same moment. And Edward Steichen even quoted Clement Greenberg, who was saying that painting owned abstraction, so photography should embrace its connection to representation. And at the precisely the same moment as Greenberg is saying, this is what photography should do, um, Steichen is organizing exhibitions from the collection, or not from the collection, organizing exhibitions, some of which works made their way into the collection, of, that featured a strong representation of women photographers, and that were unabashedly saying, well, no, photography has abstraction too. You know, and for us, um, these kind of points and counterpoints between what was happening between painting and photography were really interesting and ones we wanted to highlight. Other questions? Yes, please. So, uh, I have a question. I, I wondered if you have a favorite story about a moment of discovery in storage here in Queens or in New York, because you told us about Columbia, so I'm wondering about here. Several. Um, well, uh, yeah, there are, there are several. Um, well, one story that comes immediately to mind is, is one of the works that was added most recently to the exhibition, which is the painting by Eleanor Micus, who was on our radar. We have a lot of prints by her because she made prints at the Tamarind Lithography Workshop, and we have the entire archive from the 60s of Tamarind. And we looked at those prints and thought about including them, but um, ended up thinking they, they didn't quite work. And we were aware there was a painting, but honestly, it was, it was made in 64. It was uh, a gift of Louise Nevelson in 1965. Uh, it was shown in a recent acquisition show after that, and since then, it, it hasn't been shown at all. There was not a good photograph um, in CEMS. And honestly, collections I will system. confess, it sort of dropped out of my mind. And then, um, Craig Starr recently had a show of Eleanor Micus, and I went to see it on the last day, and it was beautiful. And so we quickly thought, well, let's get that painting out and see if we can get it in the show. And it was in a very old frame that really was not doing any favors to the painting, so we... Very we, dirty plexiglass, you yeah, couldn't even see it. You couldn't even see, it's just a subtle surface with, with a little bit of relief that you couldn't even see the relief. So uh, we have a brilliant framer in-house who, who worked his magic and, um, and reframed it so that it, it comes to life. And um, that was one of, our, one of the stories of uh, works that came into this show through our combing of the collection. But you know, there are a number of works in the show that Star and I, with a group of colleagues, were out in Queens looking at work and storage in anticipation of the reinstallations in 2019. And we were, you know, looking in that Janet Sobel painting, which also, you know, it was such it was such an exciting day in Queens, because of course we're seeing these things and thinking, how do we tell, you know, how do we make this the center of the story? How do we look at this this way? And that Janet Sobel painting, when we saw it, we were like, looks nice, but you know, it had about a four inch white frame that overlapped the edge of the board, and it just it the impact was so deadening to the work and it was not an original frame it was a frame that was applied later by curators so don't don't don't, be, don't blame Janet um, but we brought it over and we thought well wow what would this look like if we could take and so we went to conservation um, we went to the frame shop with our conservators and we looked at it and we took it out of that frame and thought oh my gosh look at the way this comes to life when you when our magical frame shop can really help us present it in a different way. So, um, but we, I think we each have probably a dozen stories like that. Yeah, just, just one other quick one um, has to do with the, the 
the design objects that you see, which is not the um, expertise of either one of us. So we leaned heavily on our colleagues in the in the design department, especially Juliet Kinchin, um, to show us these things, which honestly, I mean, I didn't know anything about it. And now I know that Lucien Day, who you see in the show, is a really very important figure. And, um, you know, that was just really a revelation for me. Um, what we have in the collection, how it speaks, as Glenn was saying, to, to the other um, mediums and is very much part of the story, especially of women artists and abstraction in the post-war period. Because of course, you know, one of the reasons that women were able to start having major careers after World War II was because they were able to start going to university and to art schools earlier in the century, which in most countries they didn't have um, as many opportunities. And, but still, they were often um, diverted to, to, to weaving or textiles or ceramics, a sort of craft tradition. So it's very much an important part of the history of women artists. And you see a figure like Annie Albers, who's so, so critical to that history, who um, really bridges um, um, the disciplines between craft and quote unquote fine art and how much she influences um, the generation that comes in, in to play in the 60s with fiber art. I mean, if you listened again to the audio guide, Juliet's observation that this was abstract art you could buy by the yard. And it's just such a wonderful poetic way of making connections sort of that respect the individuality. You know, we love that design moment. You know, it, it is both distinct from and yet very much a part of the overall concept of the show. Other questions? Yes, please. I can't see you, so just talk loudly. who migrated here went out of fear and survival in their work? Was there something that connected them to perhaps a woman who was in the internment camp? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, there are, I mean, part of this, the history of this period is how much migration there was and, and the, the, um, the recent traumas of World War II and the reconstructions and the movement. And so a lot of the women in the show uh, migrated from Europe, to, whether to the United States or to uh, Latin America or even, um, you know, within countries in Europe. So um, that's very much a part of it. And we tried to bring that out a little bit in some of the um, extended labels, but of course there's much more to say. And each artist, each of the artists has just an incredibly powerful story biographically. Um, I don't know that you see it necessarily directly in all of the works, but it's definitely, I think, part of, part of their histories and part of what made them I mean, these were really strong, strong people. And we were just talking with somebody in the galleries about how there's, I think of the 50 plus women in the show, there are still 12 who are alive and they're all in their 80s or older. Um, and, but many of the other women lived very long lives into their 90s or even 100. Uh, so these were people with really, really strong uh, constitutions and there's something very inspiring about, about all of their stories as we research them. Um, our curator assistant, Hillary Reeder, did a lot of that work. I just have to acknowledge mm -hmm. her. Yes. And, uh, Wave your hands. <laughs> hands so everybody can see you. She's wearing a dress that matches Lena Bobardi's chair today. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yes, please. So given sort of where the show starts is this place sort of that most of us are all very familiar with, this abstract expressionism, and you know about Lee Krasner and Helen Frankenthaler and Joan Mitchell, and you know that they're, they're the handful of women who sort of got you know, onto the radar with all those men. Um, but going forward now to the end of the show, 
I was just wondering from a collecting point of view, if you feel like you are still filling in gaps to acquire women artists um, through that period, or do you feel that things are sort of evened out and you're not filling in mm. the gaps? I was just, I'm trying mm. to sort of get some sense of between this, this because the show does start off with this uh, period, which, you know, it, we've all read about it, sort of been drummed into everybody that this, you know, these women were really marginalized. And I was just wondering, as curators working in with the collection, where you saw that now? Yeah, I think um, I might argue that as you go through the exhibition, there are names that most people familiar with um, art made after the Second World War uh, with which they're familiar. So in the second gallery, you know, Louise Nevelson is a, is a familiar, you know, as familiar, I think, as Joan Mitchell or Lee Kras, is that fair? I think so. Um, or Agnes Martin um, in the third, or Sheila Hicks, perhaps, maybe not quite as well known, but certainly Annie Albers in the fourth. Lee Bontecou, you know, um, certainly Louise Bourgeois, Ava Hesse, you know, these names are, are sort of, uh, markers around which narratives of art after the Second World War are told. So what was interesting to us was to say, okay, well, how do you make this, how do you expand these narratives around these women, these achievements? So how do you include not just the names that you might know best, but introduce other names from the collection? And we, we spent a lot of time looking at other works um, by artists that we were less familiar with saying, and with Hillary's help, developing an understanding of where they were coming from and what they were trying to do. So it's not, it's not only about, um, I'd say it's not maybe not so much about filling gaps in the collection as filling gaps in our knowledge, understanding how these works fit in and how do you tell, you know, we had this incredible opportunity to tell a story that didn't just include the women who might, you know, um, Joe Bayer was in the 1960s show, but how do you make a broader picture around that through research and looking? But you could add, you know, just to come back to a, a question Lee asked, the, 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 the value of these kinds of exhibitions for us, I hope, uh, and even more so for our public, is by looking carefully at what we have, we become acutely aware of what we need to do. Uh, so as satisfying as an exhibition might be, for most of us, it's actually a catalyst to thinking about what isn't. Uh, what isn't here, what isn't expressed, what hasn't been articulated, voices that, that we need to tease out, not just in, in an installation, but across the institution. So your question is apt in that the familiar is satisfying but less interesting ultimately to us as the unfamiliar, which is what we have to, in a way, find a way to foreground so that those voices become part of a larger conversation. Uh, and, and I think this exhibition goes a long way to doing that within the frame of what we currently have, but it also is a provocation to keep the work up and expand. So I didn't mean to, to interrupt you. Um, just piggybacking on what you just said, um, do you foresee an exhibit similar to this, let's say, instead of post-war abstraction, uh, conceptual art, minimal art, pop art, w with a female focus? Because the, clearly there's a lot of female artists that are neglected in those narratives as well. Well, I, I don't think there are current plans to do that in the naming an exhibition and building around it. But I think that what Glenn is pointing to is we are constantly looking at the way in which the narratives that we tell around pop art conceptualism and saying to ourselves, how do we look um, at a broader representation for those, not only through the lens of gender, but geography, race, you know, the, it's, um, so for us, it's woven into a larger effort of expanding the way we tell any narrative of any any moment that you could point to and seeing like 
where, what could we learn, what could we look at both in our collection and outwards uh, to do. So that, you know, this is why we spend a lot of time in Queens and traveling. <laughs> I should say Queens is where the majority of the collection is stored. I mean, there are many good reasons traveling to go to Queens. Traveling all the way to Queens, right. <laughs> there are many good reasons to be in Queens, but uh, we're there in part because uh, the vast right. majority of our Taking collection is located granted. there. Just, just to add a little bit to what Sarah said and what Glenn said a little bit earlier, I mean, our goal is not to show women artists just in um, women-only contexts. Not at all. Um, we've done it a few times in our history. We've done sort of all women shows, but not too often. It's really to, to look at this history, to spotlight, give some visibility to a lot of these women artists who are not always on view, and then to spark uh, ideas amongst all of us about how to um, reimagine these works in other contexts, including integrating them into uh, more, more, much more than we have been, into our permanent collection galleries. But we did feel that this particular moment, right after World War II, was a really interesting period that hadn't really gotten a lot of attention in terms of women's, um, the history of women in the arts. I mean, we kind of have sometimes talk about the show as like pre WAC because there was the WAC show in 2007, I think that Connie Butler did, which was a much larger uh, project, but that spotlighted um, the work of, of women um, in, in connection to the feminist movement that developed in the late 60s and 70s. And this is sort of the moment before that and what happened before that when women didn't have these support networks or a, you know, a particularly f uh, clear, um, organized um, feminist uh, goal to rally around and, and what was it like for them and how did, how did they do it, what happened, and how does that history um, continue to inform the work of artists, women artists, but also men artists. I mean, just to spotlight how great the achievements they made during uh, during those decades. And I should say there's an exhibition opening at uh, MoMA PS1 shortly focused on Carolee Schneemann, whose work we have been acquiring aggressively. And that exhibition at MoMA PS1 is effectively a collection show from the Museum of Modern Art and its uh, body of work, which ties it right back to WAC, where you know you can see uh, Carolee is just a kind of pivot point in this conversation between the, that post-war moment and the feminist moment. And it's totally coincidental that these shows are overlapping, but it's also wonderful when they do. Other questions? If not, Sarah and Star will be here and can answer anything that might spring to mind privately. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Glenn.